Yeah, yeah sure. J just one word to introduce you. So welcome everyone after the lunch. I hope you have a healthy, healthy lunch. So uh, now it's, I will, it's time uh, to talk about uh, the um, 3D printing has a, a tool to, to, to go from functional foods to cultured meat. And we have the pleasure, I have, I have the, the pleasure to introduce you Lorenzo Pastrana, uh, we, who is currently the chair of the research office and group leader of the food processing and nutrition group at the International Iberian Tec uh, Nanotechnology Laboratory. So welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation to, to speak here today. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Thank you very much for inviting me to 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 take part of this uh, uh, event. Uh, well, I, I would like to uh, to 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 introduce my uh, my institution. So I am working at INL. INL uh, is a very brand new uh, institution. Uh, actually. Uh, we are 10 years old, uh, uh, more or less. So we are the only intergovernmental institution in the world devoted to nanotechnology. We are located in Braga, in the north of Portugal. And um, we, uh, right now, we, uh, we, we have two member states uh, 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 because uh, it was an initiative uh, promoted by Spain and Portugal to create an um, uh, institution uh, uh, to uh, create uh, science and to develop applications uh, in nanotechnology. Just to show um, uh, a very short uh, video, um, just to, to, to show you the, the, uh, our building, our facilities, and the kind of things that we, uh, we are doing. So, uh, of course, that uh, all of you are invited to uh, physically uh, uh, visit us uh, 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 in Braga, uh, but uh, as you can see in the video, we are covering practically uh, all the main applications of uh, nanotechnology in the fields of uh, uh, health, uh, energy, ICT, uh, uh, environment, and of course, uh, food. We have a very uh, uh, well equipped uh, state of the art uh, regarding micro and nano fabrication, as you can see in this uh, uh, video with the clean room, and as well in the characterization of uh, nanomaterials, uh, uh, mainly focusing uh, electron microscope uh, uh, equipments, um, etc. So our labs are um, all of them brand new, and uh, we are working right now around uh, 400 people uh, from 45, uh, 50 uh, uh, different nationalities. Uh, so we, we are really international from this uh, point of, of view as well. And um, uh, our, our main uh, funding scheme is a research project from different uh, funding sources, uh, mainly European sources, but as well national. Uh, industrial contracts with uh, different companies around the world uh, and of course uh, um, uh, yeah entrepreneurship uh, activities so this is just to to, to introduce a little bit uh, uh, the the diagonal but uh, uh, passing to the to the food uh, why INL is working in food uh, INL is working in food uh, mostly because uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, uh, the food that uh, we need to uh, we 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 going to need to produce for feeding the 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 world population in 30 years uh, will come from new technologies that are not uh, yet developed or are uh, still uh, in in a very early stage of uh, development. So we need to develop technologies to uh, to produce this amount of food. So and this is an opportunity to reinvent the food product system. So uh, we are really convinced that uh, we can contribute to create a more sustainable uh, uh, food system, a more healthy food system, and a more trusty food system. So the idea is to face the 
main problems that uh, the food system uh, uh, has in, uh, currently, with, uh, which are the sustainability of, of the food system. Uh, uh, the, 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 the production of, of, of uh, meat is uh, uh, really a problem of, uh, of uh, sustainability. Uh, we want to do uh, more healthier foods. So uh, right now, uh, foods uh, are responsible for uh, um, a big problem of uh, public health. Uh, I am talking about uh, diabetes. I am talking about obesity. I am talking about uh, hypertension. So uh, we need to develop functional foods. We need to develop more sustainable um, uh, ways to conserve, uh, preserve, and package uh, food. And of course, we have to face uh, another important uh, problem, which is the uh, urbanization and the aging. One out of three people in Portugal uh, will be uh, over 60s uh, in, uh, in 10, 20 years. And Portugal is a small country, but uh, this is the same uh, demographic trend in China and in other countries around the world. So aging population to uh, target specific uh, 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 foods for this uh, population and, uh, and for, for people that are living in, in, in cities is uh, really a challenge regarding food personalization. And this is our main three drivers uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at INL. Uh, regarding functional foods, we are working in functional foods in different, uh, in different ways. We are working, for example, uh, uh, study uh, the micro and nano structure of uh, different food ingredients. One of the fields of activities that we are facing is uh, structuring fats, oil and fats, and to obtain new uh, uh, high content omega-3 and uh, unsaturated fats, uh, solids, uh, in order to replace uh, animal or saturated fats in, in food. We are working as well in technologies of, uh, that allow us to micro and nano encapsulate uh, bioactives in order to improve the bioavailability and biodisponibility of uh, uh, bioaccessibility of, of, of these uh, bioactive ingredients uh, like uh, antioxidants, antimicrobials, but as well as uh, CST uh, regulators, for example, to, uh, to fight uh, the, the obesity. So, uh, technologies for uh, for improving and enhancing the bioactivity is as well uh, a field of our activity, and we are working together other colleagues in uh, at INL to develop devices to assess uh, the toxicology and the functionality of these these new nanomaterials that we're going to introduce in the uh, in the food industry. So we are developing new systems for checking and for uh, 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 testing. Uh, these nanomaterials. For example, we are working in this gaton a chip, organ a chip uh, uh, devices by, based on microfluidics uh, to evaluate the uh, bioactivity of uh, nanomaterials. Uh, regarding uh, uh, footprinting, well, uh, this is a brand new line, uh, uh, research line as well at INL. Uh, we did uh, different experiments and different activities uh, regarding um, uh, 3D printing. Uh, just to comment, by the way, for example, uh, regarding this is for, for, for Maria Manuel. For example, we are uh, working incorporating microalgae in bread, for example, with 3D printing. This is uh, one example of uh, how we can use uh, 3D printing to incorporate new ingredients in the formulation of, of uh, of uh, uh, yeah, uh, new products uh, and in different uh, applications regarding sensations, uh, etc. But uh, today uh, I would like to go uh, through uh, something that uh, uh, it was already uh, comment this morning by by Antonio, uh, which is how we can use uh, 3D printing uh, food to personalize food, combining the individual requirements uh, of the different people. We can address target population, a specific target population with specific needs uh, to calculate the, the, the nutritional uh, pro profile of each kind of uh, target group and planning and design a recipe and to print this recipe in a real personal uh, uh, way. So we are working uh, uh, on that. 
But our approach, uh, uh, and this is uh, one of the comments that uh, uh, we uh, we already discussed uh, this morning, it's much more to understand uh, what are the relationship, the science, the, the behavior behind the, uh, uh, the, the, the behavior of, uh, of ingredients, uh, of physical chemical properties of ingredients in relationship with uh, the uh, variables uh, regarding the, the printers, no, the the the, the, the engineering, and um, instead to work uh, with uh, a conventional, I don't know, uh, uh, foods like uh, I don't know, potato, mashed potato, or chocolate, which is a classical ingredient for 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 studying. Uh, uh, we decide to go through uh, models, uh, hydrocolloids. Uh, in order to understand how this micro uh, and nanostructure of, of, of different inks uh, could determine uh, different printability properties uh, 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 and try to understand how uh, this, uh, uh, this behavior. We, uh, we work uh, mostly with uh, uh, whey protein and gelangam, some other hydrocolloids, and we determine in this way uh, how this, uh, as you can see here, uh, how this uh, microstructure of, of, of the matrix can determine different profiles of uh, 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 share stress or, or, or pressure or printability at the end of the day, printability of these uh, of, of these um, uh, footings. So, in other words, we can determine uh, by using this kind of models the printability and the zone of printability, the area of printability of different uh, uh, compounds, and uh, uh, and to correlate the uh, physical chemical properties of this uh, soft matter with uh, the printability properties uh, or, 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 yeah, uh, or features of these, uh, of these uh, um, um, footings. So the idea of uh, correlate printability score with rheological properties is really important in order to design in the future uh, new foods for particular, uh, 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 particular purposes. This morning, uh, uh, we talk uh, uh, about uh, swelling, uh, elderly, uh, et cetera. So we need to, to know exactly what is the, this correlation in order to map, uh, 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 to, to map this and, uh, uh, and, and, and to know what are the zones uh, where we can uh, really obtain a uh, reliable uh, uh, with um, uh, re reliable shape and reliable uh, uh, print. Uh, of course, that uh, uh, we did uh, experiments uh, very similar to that uh, were presented uh, this morning by by Antonio in order to uh, yeah to know the fidelity the the, the reproducibility uh, uh, of of different shapes. Uh, uh, to, to understand this uh, this process, but one important application or practical application of this knowledge uh, is presented in this experiment in, in this slide. How to use uh, this knowledge to design functional foods based on uh, traditional ingredients. So the idea uh, uh, here uh, was uh, very easy. The idea is how to increment, how to improve the uh, antioxidant contents in cookies, uh, uh, considering that the cookies is a product that uh, uh, is uh, uh, suffering uh, thermal treatment. And the main part of the anthocyanins, when you incorporate uh, antioxidants like uh, anthocyanins in these uh, cookies, that will be destroyed by the, by, by the temperature. So the idea was to design different shapes of, of, uh, of uh, uh, cookies. Uh, containing uh, anthocyanins in order to uh, uh, to correlate uh, this uh, the design uh, with the, uh, the the retention of uh, antioxidant activities by anthocyanins and we demonstrate that we can design a particular shape of of the cookies that allow us to retain the uh, the fully amount of antioxidant activities in the cookies after 
uh, the thermal treatment. So in other words, we can combine uh, uh, food ingredients uh, like uh, these uh, polyphenols from grape skins uh, uh, encapsulated in uh, in nano uh, in, in this case in micro capsules, uh, put this in the in the in the dot uh, of of a cookie, and designing a pattern that allow us the uh, 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 the ventilation the 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 the, the, the uh, yeah the, the the air pass through uh, the cookie. We can uh, obtain a cookie. That is cooked is is uh, and that retain the 100 percent of the uh, of the of the antioxidant activities, and this is uh, something interesting because it's a practical uh, application, and demonstrate how we can uh, uh, combine this knowledge to design new uh, functional cookies retaining the antioxidant activities, but. Uh, if we are able to do that uh, with a cookie, why not? to create uh, 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 cultured meat. Uh, well, and the reason and the, the, the rationale behind the, the cultured meat is, uh, is shown in, uh, in this slide. So as you can see, the uh, environmental impact of, uh, of production of meat is really huge. So uh, it's not possible to, uh, uh, to keep the meat production, as we know uh, right now, uh, to feed the the population because uh, is is uh, absolutely un unsustainable. One steak, uh, uh, and one simple uh, steak uh, about uh, uh, 300 grams of uh, weight, so it's, it's a meal, uh, is uh, that contains approximately uh, 60 grams of protein have a huge impact in the environment. To produce this steak, we need uh, uh, 4,650 liters of water, and that represents around uh, 30 kilograms of CO2 uh, produced by, by, by the coal. So this is really impossible to sustain for a large amount of uh, uh, people. The problem uh, of, of, of uh, meat is the, uh, this particular structure, the properties of the meat regarding color, flavor, appearance, etc., um, came from these uh, micro uh, and nano structures of the, of the proteins in, in, in fibers uh, and in, in, in muscles. And the idea to, to reproduce or to mimic uh, by 3D printing this structure is really challenging because it's a combination of uh, uh, new uh, additive factoring like uh, 3D printing. And, and this is the reason that we need to understand what are the relationship between the, 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 the properties of, 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 the, uh, of uh, the, the physical chemical properties of the soft matter and the, and the, and the printability. With uh, um, yeah, with uh, tissue engineering and, and cell cultures, so the idea is to uh, to pick up a cell uh, from a cow to uh, reproduce or to grow the, this cell in a bioreactor in order to have enough amount of uh, cells, animal cells, and later on to put these cells in a scaffold and to mature uh, to uh, the, the cells uh, to produce. The, uh, the the final uh, meat. The uh, advantage uh, of uh, cultured meat uh, production comparing with traditional meat production are real uh, clear. So uh, uh, it's uh, much more healthier, much more safer, uh, no antibiotics. Uh, and the idea is to reduce the cost and the environmental impact of uh, having a bioreactor instead to have a, a cow. The, 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 the idea at, at the end is uh, to combine this 3D food printing, which is uh, just to extrude uh, uh, food ink, but not putting the cells uh, on the top of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the food ink, because this is uh, this is not a bioprinting, so this is just a, a post-production 
of uh, of cell uh, animal cells in the in the, the printing. So the real challenge is to print a real 3D food bioprint. So to incorporate uh, cells and to extrude the cells uh, uh, during the uh, during the, the process. And this is challenges because the uh, the shared stress and the and and the and the, uh, uh, and the scaffolds and the inks have to allow survive the animal cells and have to allow to mature and to grow the the, the, the animal cells. So it's, it's a double challenge. So the idea is to uh, to uh, reproduce or to mimic uh, the uh, uh, the micro uh, structure and the complexity of the of the muscle fibers uh, uh, in, a, in combining single inks or multi inks. For example, combining these oleogels or these uh, solid uh, uh, unsaturated fats uh, inks. Uh, to uh, yeah to, to mimic this uh, well the, 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 uh, this structure of 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 the meat well uh, just to show uh, uh, the the idea is uh, one important challenge is the the, the resolution so uh, the resolution is very important because that will determine the uh, not only the printability, but uh, as uh, discussed this morning, as well the scale scalability and the texture of of the final result. But just to uh, to comment that uh, with low resolution, uh, we estimate that with low, uh, low resolution. Uh, later on, I, I'm going to to, to show some uh, some some picture with low resolution. We estimate that uh, in in the highest uh, uh, printing speed uh, with the highest uh, diameter, which is resolution three uh, millimeters, we can produce 500 kil kilograms of meat per hour, uh, and this is really something that is scalable. Is this is uh, something that is really uh, could be implemented at industrial scale. Probably uh, this low resolution uh, has not uh, the same uh, properties regarding texture that uh, uh, the high resolution. But even at high resolution, we can produce one stack, uh, 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 more or less, uh, uh, per hour with a really, really high re uh, resolution speed. So, and this is something that is really uh, feasible and affordable for industrial scale. Let me show uh, what is the uh, 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 how uh, how looks uh, uh, the, the 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 printed uh, meat. So as you can see here in the in the bottom part. This is, oh sorry, in the bottom part, this is a real uh, piece of meat uh, steak. It's a raw uh, piece of meat. Uh, uh, later on, uh, when the, the oh sorry, when the the meat is cooked, uh, this is the the the, the well the, the appearance uh, of the meat. But look at this high resolution piece of meat made with uh, uh, whey protein uh, cells uh, uh, cells uh, from yeah from culture uh, cells uh, and uh, a polysaccharide phase that uh, provide the, the 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 structure. As you can see in high resolution, so there are uh, the, the difference uh, comparing a real piece of meat is, is, is very similar. Even a low resolution with a tip of uh, 1.6 uh, millimeters, uh, we can have a well, uh, a good, uh, 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 well, a, a good appearance uh, comparing, uh, com comparing a, 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 a meat. And as you can see here, the structure is a very complex structure that allows us to obtain this kind of uh, of, 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 of products. At the, oh, sorry. At the end, this is uh, the final result. This is uh, a model uh, printed with these uh, hydrocolloids plus uh, uh, cultured cells containing 20% uh, of protein, which is uh, more or less, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, 
a, a amount, a reasonable amount of protein um, comparable with some meat, so some steaks. And uh, well, uh, we need to uh, to refine a little bit because uh, yes, as you can see here, uh, uh, when the, the, this piece of meat, uh, cultured meat, is fried. Uh, well, the appearance is not so appealing. <laughs> uh, well, but uh, that looks like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, a piece of uh, yeah, uh, uh, roasted uh, uh, meat. Well, the most important thing probably that I would like to, to demonstrate here is that combining the, the, the knowledge that we have uh, using uh, ink food ink models with uh, printing and combining this with the knowledge that we have regarding uh, um, uh, culture of, uh, of uh, tissues and cells, we can obtain this kind of, of, of solution. And this is something that uh, 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 the investors are paying a lot of interest. So uh, this is a, my last slide. It's just to, uh, to show you that this is not a, a hype. This is really a trend in the market. So the global meat sector is moving uh, this uh, amount, uh, this huge amount of, 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 of money in, in, in the market. And this is estimated that culture meat uh, uh, will, uh, uh, will introduce a new player in the, in the, in the, in the, in the market. But probably the most important thing is look at the companies that are investing in culture meat technologies. Is Tyson, is uh, Cargill, is Nutreco. So the traditional uh, meat companies are putting money in this new sector. So that means that in the next years is expected that uh, uh, there, there is room enough uh, to develop new solutions for uh, not only for meat uh, animal terrestrial animal meats but as well for fish for other animal products uh, milk eggs uh, etc but uh, uh, this is in, uh, for 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 doing that it's important to understand what are the uh, uh, yeah the, the 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 science behind uh, the extrusionability and the printability of, of the full things. I would like to thank my, my team. Uh, is uh, a team of uh, really passionate uh, nano workers. Uh, they, uh, they are not small, uh, <laughs> are uh, a really a passionate combination of engineers, uh, biologists, chemists, uh, etc. And I would like to thank as well uh, our funding institutions, uh, particularly the Good Foods Institute from states that uh, uh, is paying a, a, a big part of this uh, of this work. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. We have now uh, time for uh, questions and uh, discussion. I, I have two or three questions that I will do it at the end. Just to, I will give the, the chance, the opportunity to the the people to, to, to do some questions. Jeff, Jeffrey, you have one question? You don't, you, you're you, mute. You are, you're you, mute. Could you explain the philosophy why you've decided to uh, print your meat uh, as uncooked and then have traditional cooking as against preparing cooked, cooked components that then could be assembled? Well, uh, because it's uh, easier. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, much more complicated to, uh, to take uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the meat components and to uh, resemble. So the, this is something that is uh, quite frequent in, 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 in nature. So nature uh, uh, is uh, particularly uh, uh, well-performing uh, self-assembling uh, process. So is uh, so the the, the process the, the self-assembling process in, in nature happens um, 
really, really well and in a reproducible uh, way. Mm, this is not so easy to uh, to do uh, with uh, 3D printing. So the complexity of this uh, self-assembling process, or in other words, the conditions to 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 mimic this uh, self-assembling process, are really difficult to reproduce uh, in the lab. So for us, it's much more simple to take uh, uh, yeah uh, these uh, other ingredients and try to mimic uh, the texture and the shape and the flavor of 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 the meat. This is one reason. The, the second reason is regarding uh, uh, the, the former slide, the, the industrialization. If you think uh, in uh, go ahead uh, through uh, an industrial scale with, uh, with culture meat, we need to use uh, commodities. We need to use really uh, raw ingredients that uh, uh, have a low price, uh, have a, are um, yeah, available enough around the world, uh, and this is the 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 reason that we uh, we selected whey, we selected uh, hydrocolloids like uh, gelang, gum, or alginate, or, or this kind of of, of ingredients. Yes. So are much more available, uh, cheaper, and are commodities. Yes. I suppose my question was, for, I very much uh, agree with you, the importance of understanding the processes of the 3D printing and all of the other components required to understand the science. But you've left one of the key steps to the product that the consumer will, will eat to a, a, a perhaps a, a less understood process where it's much more difficult to understand the transformation of the of the the printed structure to the to the cooked meat. I, I, that was really my point, and so that sounds because it's a it's a solid object. So is there not a way of better understanding that process to able to generate the the cooked meat? That was the thought that was going through my my mind. Very good point. Very uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Yeah. Well, th this is the, the the first steps. We are initiating this uh, research line, yes. and of course that uh, uh, well, uh, we, we need to understand the the, the, the second part of, of the equation, uh, which is uh, exactly that. So yes. how behaves <laughs> this uh, yes, this yes. Uh, steak, this artificial steak, uh, when it's cooked? Uh, well. Uh, the the first trials are that behaves uh, well uh, pretty well, but of course that uh, is uh, this is in a very early early stage, so it's it's, it's, yeah. it's too early to yeah, to answer your question. No, very interesting, though. thank you. And what what about flavor? Did you try it already? Well, probably flavor is the is the the, the easy part, really? the, the, the 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 easiest uh, part of of this equation. Because uh, yeah, uh, flavor is uh, really easy to to, to mimic. Uh, yeah, adding uh, nucleotides, uh, adding some flavors, uh, glutamate. So, is is this this is the minor? Our understanding is uh, that uh, that could be no so complicated. Uh, for us, it's much more complicated uh, to mimic uh, the texture, of course. Uh, and uh, and it's a challenge, as as, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Mitchell said, uh, how these uh, behave uh, uh, during the the thermal treatment. Yeah, uh, the, I, 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 I just say because there are a lot of meat substitutes, but the flavor is not very. Uh, it's unpleasant for the majority of the people. So that's why I'm asking how you are dealing with the flavor. I, I not fully agree. So um, mm. I taste uh, uh, the Impossible Burger, for example, uh, the Beyond Meat. Uh, I taste uh, some uh, uh, at the very beginning, so uh, some years ago, and uh, and right now uh, I realize that uh, uh, this plant-based uh, 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 meat alternatives are pretty well. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, are, are really good uh, from a flavor point of view. So, 
I, I, I don't find that uh, this, for example, billion meat uh, is um, disgusting uh, at all. <laughs> so of course that is is better a uh, barrosa or uh, from the <laughs> from the flavor point of view because uh, this is our habit. Yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is an interesting point because I, I remember I, I I was a child. Um, I, 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 I was the habit uh, to, dr to drink uh, uh, raw milk directly from the cow. Yeah. And uh, right now I, I, I can't, uh, uh, I can't. So it's, it's too much uh, yeah, strong for, for me, uh, you know, because the habit is to drink uh, Tetra Brick uh, uh, milk, which is much yeah. more mild. Yeah. You know? you're, you're this is sure. a question of habit. Yeah. Yes, 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 sure. And do you think this also a possibility to produce some cultured fish? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is a recent line for uh, that uh, is is uh, are many people working in, in that. Uh, there are interests in Portugal uh, for for that from 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 several companies, fish companies. Uh, and this is because for Portugal and Spain and Japan are the the the, the fish uh, uh, eaters countries <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah uh, for a question of sustain, uh, sustainability uh, uh, I think that this, this is the next step uh, in the fish industry catch aquaculture uh, and now uh, or in the future culture fish culture mm -hmm. fish meat I mean Definitely. okay we have come to the end of the I don't, I don't know if Anyone has one more question? Because we are just on time to the next speaker. No more questions? Antonio has just, one question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, very interesting uh, presentation. So I have a question about uh, the possibility to manage texture for in, in this kind of product. Because when I saw, when I study paper on 3D meat printing, uh, in general, I just see very small and simple structure, you know, cube, and the infill path is in general some, something like this, you know, parallel infill. Yeah. So this obviously help to increase the printing rate because the movement are very easy, but decrease the variability of text. So when you, when you, when you show it as uh, an estimated amount of production, like 500 kilo for hour, if I remember well, yeah. probably it is for like a, a simple cube, because if you want to create different uh, text and you have to plan a very complicated movement and complicated movement means uh, uh, acceleration and deceleration when the printer move, non-printing movement, and these, uh, for my experience, reduce the uh, the production about probably half. So, uh, what 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 about this two point? So it is possible to create differences in text. That is one of the most important things for consumers. And what about the estimation in this case of the production? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, you are right. So this is uh, uh, so this uh, uh, these estimations uh, came from a very simple uh, uh, geometric uh, pattern uh, with all the fibers aligned. In the in the same uh, direction. So, yeah, this is just to produce in uh, to to mass produce uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, some piece of meat like like this. So the, 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 uh -huh. that was made uh, in this uh, uh, in this shape. Well, uh, this is true that uh, the the reality is much more complex uh, than this, and that uh, will reduce the uh, uh, yeah the scalability of of the products. Hopefully, uh, different pieces of, of a cow, or di different pieces of, of the meeting in a cow, uh, have different uh, structure. There are pieces that are really uh, very similar, like this, uh, uh, to to the oh sorry, sorry, to the linear uh, structure. This is uh, quite uh, similar uh, to this. Uh, 
uh, and, and that uh, is made. But of course, that for more complicated um, microstructure in muscles, in, in different, in, in several muscles, is, is really complicated. But it's much more complicated not uh, to align the, the, the proteins or the, the muscle fibers. It's much more complicated to, uh, to reproduce or to mimic, and this is a challenge that we are working uh, uh, on, on this, to mimic the infiltration of fats uh, in the middle of the of the of the muscle fibers, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. is really a challenge because the texture and the and the flavor uh, of um, uh, of a parma jam or of uh, 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 yeah uh, porco preto jam <laughs> uh, uh, is uh, came from this uh, uh, mixture of different ingredients. In particular, this infiltration of the fats in the middle of the of the fibers, and this is really challenges because it is discontinuous, it's random, <laughs> it's really random, uh, and uh, to randomize <laughs> the, the, the printer uh, with two or three inks, different inks, is, is really mm -hmm. challenges from the engineering point of view. Thank you, thank you so much. It is a very interesting work. Yeah, thank you. You're muted. You are yes. muted, Ma Ma Maria. It's always the same. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lorenzo. And um, we are now moving to the presentation of uh, Jeffrey Mitchell, who is the deputy director of CDRSP. And is going to talk about electros spinning uh, a route to uh, textured food. Jeffrey. Right, thank you very much. Right, so thank you. Well, one of the, dis one of the disadvantages of being the last speaker is that nearly everything has been said. But what I would like to do in this uh, presentation is just draw attention to some highlights which are probably been things which have been mentioned, but which perhaps deserve amplification. So the Center for Rapid and Sustainable Product Development at the Polytechnic of Lyria is a center of excellence in the field of direct digital manufacturing. You can see that this is the building we've occupied since 2016, is an in an industrial area. So we're surrounded by factories which actually make things. And in the last uh, evaluation by the Portuguese Science and Technology Foundation, we were judged to be excellent. And of all of the units which were submitted in the field of mechanical engineering and engineering systems, we received the highest uh, score. So uh, that's one quant quantitative uh, evaluation of our, of our excellence. So what do we do? Well, we have a very strong focus on direct digital manufacturing. I think we probably prefer the term direct digital manufacturing to additive manufacturing because there are also subtractive methods of digital manufacturing and maybe even a combination of both is a, provides a good, a good a good methodology. Whereas talking about additive manufacturing or 3D printing, it's focusing on a technology rather than what we're trying to achieve. So in this indirect manufacturing, we take the digital file, we convert, convert it into a solid object using a one of a number of different technologies of which we've already heard about several of these to generate a, a finished part. Now, oh, I could put this on too. Um, so, and this technology can be used to making products in almost every sphere of the, of the, that are possible, but you can see in this particular schematic, Cursor. 
you can see what's referred to as speciality food. And all of this is forms part of the so-called fourth industrial revolution and people imagine that in the future, many things, if not most things, will be manufactured in this way. And we've heard about some of the advantages of the personalization, the delocalization of manufacturing, et cetera. These, and so this could have a huge change on the culture of manufacturing and the culture of, of, of our society. So let's think about food and answer the question why we like some foods. Um, this has been mentioned several times, so we might naturally think, is it taste buds in the tongue? We can taste sugar and salt and other things in the, in, in the, in the tongue. Well, no, probably not the way that uh, we like some foods. And so here's a schematic of, of a person and the, all of the parts here in the lower part of the body, which are concerned with digestion. These play no part in our choice of food, apart from a, a philosophical or a lifestyle choice before we eat it, but it doesn't make any difference to the way in which we, the food we eat, unless of course it causes us to vomit, in which case um, then we've rejected that food. That's not, a, that's not meant to be an indication of that's likely to happen with this particular fast food chain products, um, but, uh, that. but no, it's the mouth. The mouth is the entry gateway and effectively when we're eating something accepts or rejects food. And of course that does have the, the, the taste buds in it, but a key part of thinking about how we uh, uh, process and eat food is the texture, as just we've just been discussing in Lorenzo's uh, questions and answers um, about the texture. The texture is, a, is as important as a taste, and many studies show the texture is in actual fact a more important um, uh, system for whether we, whether we find food acceptable or not. Just think of some of those things um, like uh, that have a, a very unusual a texture, some slime or, or something we probably find more difficult to more difficult to eat. And the the and so the texture is comes in and I've put on here two foods, one of which we've I think we've probably seen both of these before, chocolates and ice cream. Both of these foods have are stabilized by small crystals in them and so when they're in our mouth the food changes so if you eat by uh, savoring the food in your mouth you'll have a different experience than if you eat the uh, uh, the pieces the pieces directly so obviously digital manufacturing comes into this because it provides a family of technologies which can place different types of food in physical patterns on a scale that's compatible with the mouth and it provides a family of technologies which can generate different length scales of structure and patenting. And um, the mouth is a, a, is a sensitive part of the body and people have shown that it's possible to, for the mouth to sense the presence of particles as small as two micrometers. Two micrometers, I realize we're all scientists and engineers, but to put it into context, if we take the typical black hair of of a Portuguese person, two micrometers is 50 times smaller than the diameter of the hair. Now, the technology I want to talk about is, is electrospinning. Um, I would see electrospinning as part of the family of digital uh, manufacturing, and it's a, a technique which uses electrostatic forces by using electric field to polarize a solution, which then uses electrostatic forces to pull out the fiber into a, into a fine, maybe nanometer or micrometer scale fiber and generate um, uh, in this particular case shown here, a random mat of, of, of 
of fibers. Um, this is a technology that's been around a long time. It was invented at the sort of discovered at the start of the 20th century, uh, experienced a resurgence in the 1990s, and this has been growing. And this is just staggering. It, this is just a good example of technological development. So when somebody first thought of this idea, they could make fibers that were smaller than any method they had of imaging them. So this was entirely a conceptual idea that fibers could be made this small. They could see a macroscopic assembly of them, but not the individual fibers. And now we've reached a point where rather than seeing electrospinning as a laboratory curiosity, we need to move it into a manufacturing process for it to make progress. So this shows some of the uh, uh, key parts. I keep losing the... So this is a, a syringe with a metal needle to which is applied a high voltage with respect to a grounded uh, collector and the charging in the in the solution generates an electrostatic force which pulls the fibers towards the collector and because of the charged nature of the fiber it generates instabilities and so we have this rather randomized trajectory and it's possible to end up with a random array of fibers. The time in which the solution leaves the needle to the time it arrives at the collector is, is of the order of tens of milliseconds. And in that time, the polymer solution is transformed from a solution which may contain five, 10, 20, 30% of polymer into a solid fiber and all of the solvent is removed. It's really quite a very rapid change in the, in the process. Now, if we collect the fibers onto a rotating collector as shown here, it's possible for us to generate arrays of, of fibers, of parallel fibers with particular, with a, common, with a common direction. Or if we don't do that, we can end up with a random array of fibers as shown in the photograph here. Now, just as all of the things we've been hearing about uh, the processing conditions, etc., determine what we get, then in the same way with uh, electro spinning, the properties, the, the output of the system depends upon the solution viscosity, and this depends upon the polymer molecular weight or the concentration in the solution. And if we're in the low area here, then typically we have these beads. So we have fibers, but we also have beads. Um, we shouldn't see these beads as being a bad thing. It just means that we have another structure there. And of course, if we're trying to generate texture, then maybe having another structure there could be very useful. If we go to uh, higher concentrations, then we start to see these um, smooth, uh, smooth parallel sided fibers. Because in the solution, the majority of the material is the solvent, then this largely determines the force on the droplet via the interaction with the electric field. And important here is the dielectric constant of the solvent and the conductivity. And of course, we already have one very good solvent, which has a high dielectric constant, which is water. Um, and this is going to be the, the theme that I'm going to follow. But if we look at a table of, of solvents, we can see that there are other high dielectric constant uh, uh, solvents, but which we can instantly see have a certain level of toxicity connected with them. One thing that's been mentioned so far is the possibility of using electrospun fibers for encapsulation. I show here some pictures. This is not of food stuffs, but of, of uh, a, a non-volatile liquid, which has been included in the solution. 
and you can see in this figure there is a stripe running through the center of the fiber. This is in actual fact a, uh, a liquid crystal material, which is liquid at this temperature, which is in a fine channel running through the center. And um, this is just showing different views of in the polarizer um, and showing how the liquid crystal is oriented. This is completely irrelevant to this particular, uh, uh, the current topic of food, but it's easy to see the presence of the material because of the biofringent nature. Now, it's possible to do to generate this core liquid core by using coaxial spinning, where one has a, 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 a needle which has two, two channels in it, one surrounding to the, the, the central one. But in this case, this was done by simply mixing these components in a solution, and the process of electro spinning has naturally generated this uh, liquid core. And we've achieved the same process using um, uh, olive oil. Right. So now let's think about uh, electro. Oh, this is this is the fibers produced with the liquid core. So this is encapsulated. Um, the proportion of li liquid core increases as you go down the figure, and the fibers become. Uh, become larger. These are fibers on the scale of, of, a, of a few micrometers. But one of the materials I'd like to talk about is gelatin. I'm talk, going to talk about two materials, which in a sense are a little bit as we were talking about with the fish, that a lot of the fish that's, that's caught is not turned into food products, but is waste. And so in the same way, a lot of meat products and so it generates waste and, and gelatin is an output of that process. So this is a way of using it in a circular economy sort of way. And the, the other material, which Lorenzo has already mentioned is whey protein, which it comes from, a, which is a, a sort of waste product from making cheese. So gelatin is a complex system, which is, has a structure which is rather analogous to collagen from which it's uh, derived and it forms a gel in water as we're all familiar with. And the, that formation of the gel is stabilized by the formation of sequences of triple helix structures, which are similar to what's observed in collagen and the hydrogen bonding. And the uh, Glass transition depends upon the water content, but if you get below 20%, it will be glass at room temperature. And it depends, and the, the, the gel transition also depends upon the water content. Now I mentioned this particular structure because this is a sort of, we could think of this structure as being an imprint of the, of the, uh, the biologic, underlying biological material. And if we, uh, use x-ray scattering, we can use this to um, see uh, sharp peaks in the, in the diffraction patterns of the gel at room temperature, that's the black curve, which indicates there are triple helix sequences there. But as we increase the temperature and we go above the gel point, these diminish and eventually disappear. Now, if you have a material that forms a gel, obviously it, it sounds like it doesn't have the uh, rheological properties that required to make to, to electro spinning where a very low viscosity solution is required. Now, one way to do this is to break up the, hyd the hydrogen bonds and destabilize the triple helices, which can be done by using an acidic solution. So here we show some fibers spun from acetic acid, which is very straightforward. And I show the x-ray scattering pattern that shows that, yes, the triple helix structure has been uh, destroyed. Right, but rather than doing that, an alternative, an obvious alternative in my mind, would be to carry out the electro spinning at temperatures above the gel point. So if we if we do this, we have the choice of temperature of the solution, of the surrounding environment, and of the collector. And in this particular work I'm going to show here, these were more or less all of the, all of the same. 
and it's possible using this approach to generate electrospun fibers as shown there. Now, this is a, a picture that shows increasing concentration going to the bottom of the page. And at each concentration, so at the top, we can see 19.1% concentration. We can see the beaded fibers. And then as it increases, as we go across the top line, we start to get smooth parallel sided fibers. But for each of the concentrations that we might have in the solution, there is a, a lower temperature, which limits the conditions for electrospinning. So this is the point in which the material then has the rheological properties required for electrospinning. So this is in a sort of map and we can envisage that a similar sorts of behavior would be observed in other gel based systems. Um, this is plotting some of the data on there. So the, the crosses show that lower limiting uh, temperature and the diamonds one show some of the difficulty of reproducing systems in with biological materials but this shows the fiber diameter and in this you can see we're in the range of two to five hundred nanometers um, again this shows the effect of temperature and and fibers and you can see that there is a small increase in the fiber diameter with the uh, the temperature of the solution and the environment and it here showing it a different concentration and so the average fiber diameter increases with the temperature and but this this is the opposite of what's normally observed in electrospinning because as you increase the 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 concentration the viscosity increases whereas here as we increase the temperature the viscosity will decrease with temperature and we but we see an increase in the fiber diameter anyway it's, a, it's an interesting observation now coming back to the point about the triple stru helical structures this is fibers which have been electrospun so the black curve is the solution showing the sorts of peaks we're looking for these smaller peaks here are, arise from another source and when we look at electrospun fibers we don't we see maybe a little hint of something there but we don't really see any imprint of the of the triple helix structures but what we can do is to take a a electrospun material and to expose this to a uh, a, a, a humid atmosphere and then these these peaks uh, uh, reappear and so it's possible to re uh, generate the the structure that was present in the in that material. So, a summary for the the gelatin part: we can prepare fibers of gelatin can be directly prepared from aqueous solutions by using uh, elevated temperatures of spinning. Um, they show some dependence on the size, etc., and that we can redevelop the the the, the biological full biological structure by rehydration after spinning. So it's not destroyed in the, in the spinning process. Now we come to why this is the liquid remaining after the milk has been curdled and strained. And this is, this is a product in which there are some commercial uses. It's a globular protein structure. So I show a space filling model here. And so it doesn't look like the, the material that would naturally generate a low viscosity solution um, to generate electrospun fibers. I show several pictures here. This, all of the, what I'm showing here comes from the thesis work of Ji Zhong, um, who was a PhD student of mine in the, at, in the Department of Food Science at the University of Reading. And this, um, B is just trying to electrospin the whey protein, nothing happens. But if we add 1% of polyethylene oxide to the solution, then we can generate uh, a, a fibrous product by electrospinning. 
And so here's a material which will be difficult to process this in this way, but we can modify it by adding a very, very small amount, 1% of uh, the system is the high molecular weight polyethylene oxide, and it generates, we can generate electrospun fibers. This sort of material, of course, is shows some time dependence. So this is a plot of the dynamic velocity of the, of the whey protein solution and how it varies over a period of time, both as whether it's stirred or not stirred. And it, you can see that it's a, a delicate material which needs to be uh, put into the right state before it's possible to, to, to process. Now, we also attempted to understand what was happening in those processes by carrying out some small angle neutron scattering of whey protein in, in deuterated water. And the right hand side shows the, the scattering from solutions and the, the, the top curve is after zero days and the black curve is after 10 days. And so you can see there's quite a substantial change in the conformation of the molecules in, in, in the system. And this is probably see, see this as a, a general feature of biological systems. And uh, we can also, we can measure the size and shape of the molecules. It's possible to spin directly from whey protein from concentrated solutions, but they need to be in the right state and the yield is very poor. And you can see from the micrographs, this is corresponding to A is zero day, B one, one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. So after a period of time, it's possible from a solution that's been aged to be able to electro spin. <coughs> now this is a, a table which vertically shows the variation with the whey protein content going from zero to 35%. This is all in water. And across the top is the proportion of high molecular weight polyethylene oxide, which goes on the left-hand side from zero to 25% on the right-hand side. And the, 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 the cells which are colored blue are the ones where it was possible to electrospin uh, fibers and the, the, the number inside the, the box is the, is the diameter of the fiber. Um, and so it shows that we can, by controlling the, the, the nature of the solution, that we can, in this particular case, process it through electrospinning into nanoscale fibers, but only under very special conditions. And um, we can also see the fact that time, the whole process is time dependent. So here we show SEM micrographs of material electrospun from a 30% solution, including polyethylene oxide, but which if we then wait uh, uh, 10 days, transforms into a rather different sort of structure. So we've got ways in which to tune the material depending on what we want to see. So a summary for why is that it's possible to electrospin whey proteins under very carefully controlled conditions. The additions of very small concentrations of polyethylene oxide, which of course is already approved for, for food use and widely used in pharmaceuticals to the whey solutions change their behavior and properly so nanoscale fibers could be readily produced. It underpins the dynamic behavior of biological materials and demonstrates that history and processing conditions are critical to the successful fabrication.